Okay, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome. Hope everyone can hear me okay. This is Jonathan Lip here from the Big Apple Film Festival. We're waiting on a few more folks to come in, but uh, let me start by um, introducing our guest today. We have producer, actor, writer, director, and author Josh Folan is with us. Josh, Good how man. you doing Thank today? You for having me. It's cool. I haven't done one of these where I've had been able to see everyone watching. This is pretty semi-intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Josh, we're going to be talking filmmaking, uh, chat about your new book, uh, and, of course, distribution, which is one of the biggest things on our minds right now, especially in these uh, sure. crazy times we're living in. So let me uh, start first by asking if you can tell us a bit about yourself, your background, and... Uh, you know, just tell us sort of how you got to where you are today. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been, I started producing in New York, and uh, the first thing I ever did, I think, was in 09, a, a little tiny television pilot, and our indie television, aspiring to be a television pilot, <laughs> it'll be a web pilot, uh, as your first thing's going to go, probably. But, uh, so yeah, I was in New York for a long time, 13 years, I moved out to LA a couple years ago now, so uh, over the course of that time, I mean, I've, uh, I've had a creative producing role in, I, I want to say, maybe 12 or 13 films. I've done a ton of production management, uh, UPMing type stuff, line producing. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've acted and, and, and uh, done a ton of stuff in front of camera as well, but I don't think it's really relevant for what we're talking about today. <laughs> All right, cool. So in the world of distribution, the Yoda film, Ask for Jane, um, it screened at the Big Apple Film Festival, yes. one just feature film. Uh, that's available now on Apple TV, a series of cable networks. Uh, you're also involved with the film Light of the Moon, uh, which won the Audience Award at South by. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was distributed by Samuel Goldwyn. Yeah, uh, Oscilloscope I picked it up for sales, and I mean, you know, IFC did some stuff with it. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, I mean, I, that was that was a UPM job, so I was not involved in the deal making for that. So you know, that would I would probably have to refresh my memory to speak right. to it. Um, but yeah, as for Jane, it, it was released through Level Film up, up in Toronto last year. Uh, I want to say the theatrical was in May, and then our VOD window uh, uh, hit in October, I believe. Okay, and uh, and then you have some projects as well on Amazon. Sure, yeah, yeah. I have a bunch. Uh, a lot of my, you know, and that's kind of what the, the the book deals a lot in. Some of my, I've also written four features now, directed three, um, and and with the new book one of the it's, it's it's over three films ask for jamie one of them catch 22 which was a feature a dark thriller i released in that came out in january of 17 and then love is dead which came out uh on thanksgiving of 18 so it's on those three films and those the the, the range of releases that we ended up doing over the course of those three or with those three films was it was very very different you know ask for jane was <laughs> at least by ulb standards a bigger project with a more renowned cast and we were able to go kind of a more traditional route and and do things uh in a very traditional manner i suppose um amazon is an is an easy target for self-distribution which is something that again the book deals a lot in and kind of wanting to change the stigma and the lonesome <laughs> portrayal of self-distribution and amazon is one of the easy windows to, to facilitating that even though it is becoming an increasingly a uh, less uh profitable way of doing so you know uh, so yeah certainly they're all on amazon that's the easiest thing to do in distribution probably <laughs> And now I'm going to just ask you a couple of questions, then I'll give the participants uh, an opportunity to ask some questions. I'm sure the majority of them are filmmakers, you know, perhaps looking to distribute their films. Sure. Uh, right now, with everything happening in the age of COVID, um, where do you see distribution going? Do you see the theatrical market sort of remaining the way it was pre-COVID, or do you see that all changing and moving to primarily an online world? Uh, how do you that going. I, you know, I think there, there's a lot of, con you know, everything is conjecture right now, given that we're still in the midst of it and, and how it'll play out remains to be seen. But, you know, th I think there's a lot, it's kind of a, a trendy thing to say right now that, uh, you know, things are, uh, this is going to change things forever and that everything will be different from here on out. And I personally don't really subscribe to it. I think that, uh, yes, there will probably be a, sh or there will be a shortage of content and that might benefit the independent filmmaker for a brief period of time and change the way, you know, things are being acquired and, uh, you know, the money available and that occurring or, or for that to occur. Uh, 
but ultimately, you know, production will resume. I've already, you know, I, I shot a thing a few weeks ago uh, that's kind of a more traditional commercial. Uh, not, you know, I was a production managing job, so not something maybe that I necessarily would would, would be uh, interested in creatively. Uh, and it's just kind of a, a genre film that that is meant to, you know, just fill the fill the pipelines of content. And uh, you know, so so that will become a more widespread thing eventually. And and I think things will revert back to very, if if not exactly the way they were, very close to because one, you know, money will always flow. The corporations will control the money and therefore control the artists that are producing content and therefore control the content that is being distributed and available to people. And then, you know, the, the, the pipelines that are available for that are also fueled by corporate dollars and, and, and are, are uh, kept filled with things that are created in that system. So the idea that things will change and this is going to, you know, reduce the significance of theatric, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, it, it, it's so hard to say the theatrical component of it because, again, we just don't know when people are going to be able to congregate in spaces again, uh, interior spaces. But, you know, the, however it has to happen, whether it be, you know, I just watched Palm Spring last night, which is a great film, and it's a Hulu, Hulu original. So, you know, that, um, while maybe still a little weird to say, is, is one of the big players these days, you know, if you, if you want to call it a studio or not. Um, and, you know, that obviously they probably, if this wasn't occurring, that probably would have had a very traditional theatrical window, even if it's an indie-minded one, and then had its VOD release, like, or at least a day and date, you know, same time thing. Um, and that wasn't a component of that release because it just can't be, you know. So things might be a little different for a while, but eventually they will monetize things the way they were monetizing before as soon as it's... <laughs> From a you know a municipality standpoint, allowed. <laughs> I don't think things are going to change that much, to be honest with you. Um, sadly, because it would be nice, I think. So you, yeah, you mentioned the film Palm Springs, a Hulu original. Um, how do you differentiate now between what, let's say, a Hulu original is, an Amazon original, a Netflix original, between those and films that are actually being like acquired and licensed from independent filmmakers? Uh, you know, because I actually, I was just speaking with somebody recently, has a documentary on Netflix. He said, yeah, I licensed it to Netflix. Uh, they call it a Netflix original, though. So, what sure. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I can't remember exactly what had me thinking it. But when I saw it was a Hulu original, when they had that, when they, when they you know, that little logo emblazoned on it at the beginning and the end of it, uh, there was something that had me thinking that it, it I felt it was independently produced and then acquired. And I can't remember what it was now to speak to it. So maybe I shouldn't even brought that up. But yeah, I mean, there, those are two very different things for sure as far as what it means to the workflow of production and finance and everything about ma you know making a film happen and 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 uh, probably how profitable it is for the filmmaker too um yeah those are very different things for sure um i mean what what exactly let I me mean, repeat the question what exactly uh yeah like there are certain projects that will be let's say financed created by one of these platforms and then you have projects that independent filmmakers will sell. Sure. Yeah. And I, mean, I, I guess the, the easiest answer to that is, uh, again, kind of speaking to uh, things are not that different. Like, uh, that is still, the, the acquisitions are still happening through the film festival realm, I think. You know, um, the bigger festivals playing those puts you in the public eye and allows you to be seen by the buyers of, at those companies. And that's how those things get acquired very traditionally. Uh, I think, and as far as, you know, being an actual original produced in-house, of course, you know, that uh, begins at a very, a much earlier stage. Um, and, and, and. And, and how do you see the, the festival landscape changing over the course of the next year or two? Do you see it <laughs> going primarily virtual uh, or maybe some sort of hybrid kind of thing? Yeah, it goes. It, it, yeah, it goes without saying. Maybe you should be speaking to this more than me, John. But uh, yeah, I mean, to say the least, you know, I have... Uh, uh, I fortunately, you know, I don't know if it's fortunately, but I, I don't have any features that I'm, I'm uh, out schlepping to festivals currently, but I did shoot a, a, a little uh, somewhat politically charged short that I, I've, I'm doing the rounds with. It had its premiere at, at Minneapolis in what was supposed to be April, and then it got, they went virtual and ended up actually doing the, the virtual presentation in late May. So I had firsthand exposure to kind of watching it, you know, that was not their original plan, of course. They were hoping to do the festival. Last minute, they decided to make it a virtual thing. And I watched them kind of on the fly figure it out and, and turn it into 
uh, a virtual festival. And that was very interesting to watch because, you know, it's obvious that's all that's really going to be happening, I think, in 2020. I just got <laughs> uh, Telluride just emailed me today on, on our submit. You know, they sent us a general uh, submission wide email that said, you know, they're regret to inform us that the, the, the thing is going to, it's can't, they're definitely canceling the live event and they're not even going to do a virtual event and they're not even doing, they're not even going to refund. They're saying that the labor was incurred basically <laughs> on your, on your expense for the submission. And uh, you know, they're still going to do the selection process. So at least, you know, honestly, nine tenths of the benefit of a festival is just the, selection anyhow i suppose so it's not a total value loss uh that they are going to carry that out but uh, i think it's i certainly would not be on the want to be on the receiving end of that email address today <laughs> after sending out that email saying that they're not going to refund anyone uh if they're not even doing a virtual presentation of the festival you know so yeah, yes, I, I, uh, things are changing to say the least. I, you know, I was on some of the conferences that John Sloss was doing over at Synetic. I don't know if you checked. Yeah, I wa yeah, I watched the, the the festival one too. That was very interesting. Yeah, and, you know, Sundance and you know Eugene over at New York Film Festival and talking about how even you know if and when COVID ends that we may see more of a hybrid thing happening. Uh, Sundance was talking about you know having their main festival still in Park City, but possibly branching like out satellite ones. Yeah. yeah, Eugene was talking the New York Film Festival doing something outdoors, but maybe also kind of going virtual to an extent. So you're going to see a lot of, a lot of changes. Yeah. It's a, yeah, I actually have another feature. Uh, it's, Post has been a long road on that. We actually shot that right after Ask for Jane, <laughs> like a month later, and it's just now starting to do its festival thing. It had its premiere at the San Francisco Black Film Festival a few weeks ago, and it's doing the Hip Hop Festival in Cleveland, uh, which is a nice selection, actually, for, for this film. Um, and in both cases, I'm watching San Francisco in particular was like a total scramble. They, you know, uh, it's a smaller festival to begin with. And they, you know, I just don't think, uh, you know, the smaller festivals that don't have a ton of manpower trying to figure out a whole new workflow on the fly inside of a month's time is probably just a nightmare. Uh, and it was, it was interesting to watch and they did an admirable job of making it happen, but there were all <laughs> kinds of hiccups and, mm -hmm. and things that made it, uh, you know, probably less than what they would have preferred it to be. But if, um, if anybody has any questions um, regarding your own film, production, distribution, or anything like that, um, feel free, you know, we could just kind of uh, do this old school. If you could just, you can even just raise your hand as if we were at <laughs> a conference. If anybody has a question uh, for Josh, anyone at all, anyone, feel free. Tori, you got a question? Uh, yes, I had just recently, um, I didn't release my, my uh First, this is my first documentary that I had done. Uh, it's in the film festivals, like right now. I haven't released it to any platform. I wanted to know what would be uh, one of the the better distribution companies to reach out to for documentaries. Uh, well, the, the best uh, documentary railing company is, is actually what John just mentioned. Synetic is the best sales company in the documentary front in the business, in my opinion. Uh, you know, in suit, they, it's very it's tough to get them. You know, they're busy people. Uh, John's busy even aside from <laughs> running, running Synetic. He's also a lawyer. So uh, his, his, his son actually does most of the acquisitions, I think, these days. But, yeah, I mean, you know, there, there's uh, a handful of companies that are kind of A-list that are going to be very tough to approach on your own. Um, if you're talking about just releasing it, which is something, again, uh, one of the big soapbox things in the book is we need, you know, filmmakers – I think traditionally view self-distribution as this very lone, very lonely and sad place to end up at. And that results in a lot of these mid to lower tier distributors and sales companies uh, <laughs> luring, luring novice uh, filmmakers into very, very bad distribution deals. And, and that is something I think needs to change very badly, both to just weed those intermediaries out that aren't adding any value to projects and also just empower filmmakers more. I mean, it, you know, there's, there's, I go through a whole bunch of examples and stuff in there, in there that kind of explain the numbers of it. But very simply, there's a very small number of companies that, are, that do any service. Apologies. Uh, the dogs are barking here. I'm in my living room. Um, but yeah, there's a very small number of companies that are going to, for what you would give away, uh, even in, in, in a favorable distribution arrangement, uh, are going to add the value to a small project that make it worth your while um, to, to bother going that route. 
Uh, and documentary in particular is, a, is a, even a smaller niche marketplace, I think, that is, is, is even harder to find a, a company that has the track record and the experience and the resources to really get you anywhere. Um, so, you know, not to be a Debbie Downer, but it's, it's, it's you know, I, <laughs> filmmaking in general, independent filmmaking in general, I'm sure you know by now, uh, if you're that far to the process, is, is a, is a, is a uh, rough place to begin with. But, I mean, you know, the, yeah, the, you can go, on, what I would recommend doing, actually, is find five de documentaries, ten documentaries that you really enjoy that are, you were, you know, we're, we're, did a good enough job of marketing to, for you to find them and to like them and look at the companies that service them, you know, uh, both from a sales and a distribution perspective, and then reach out to those companies with the best sales pitch that you possibly can. That, you know, that's, that's the best way of doing any of this stuff. You know, when I'm looking at a distributor or looking at a sales company or looking at a financier or looking at hiring a DP, like anything, the best thing to do is just go look at their history and talk to people that have worked with them and find out, you know, if someone had a bad experience, they're going to be all about telling you all about it. So, you, you know, it's very easy to find honesty in, in, in going that route, you know, and that's the easiest way to do it, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, also understand that if you, you know, if you do release it yourself or have to release it yourself, that's not the end of the world. And honestly, and, and you'll find this out talking to the ones that are talking to the filmmakers who ended up going with a company that didn't didn't provide value, didn't provide something that um, made it worth well, what they gave away to 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 uh, enter into the agreement. Um, you know, the, yeah, you'll, the, you'll 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 it, it'll be easy to tell. They'll tell you, and you can you know, if 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 those are your only options, just put it out there yourself. Like a chimpanzee could release a film if, from a technical standpoint in 2020 like all the barrier the, the the technical and the the uh just functional barriers are all gone so don't worry about getting it out there yes it's harder to market uh yourself technically if you if, if you you know you can if you do the research and do the work there it's it's uh, also very possible but um you know and i just want to mention also just in terms of um, distributors for for documentaries um i think magnolia also is a good company Sure. Magnolia is great. They become, you know, they're obviously, you know, come a long way now. They're obviously, but Magnolia, I think, puts out some great documentaries. We had Tom Quinn. I don't know if he's still with them. Some years ago, he spoke at our festival. Uh, acquisitions there, um, but yeah, I mean, Magnolia is great, and Samuel Goldwyn, which I mentioned before, um, and then obviously the documentary festival uh, community as well. You go to Doc NYC. You go to Hot Docs. You know those guys. I mean, are you know great? I mean, they definitely attract those those documentary uh, distribution companies. You know, a couple other. I think you might be looking at it backwards. I think a lot of those festivals are populated by films that are already with those companies. But <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> yeah. Like, uh, yeah, Doc NYC, which I attend every year. You know, more than half the films I end up seeing already them. already represented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. A lot of them are released by HBO documentary films and things. Right. Like um, but you can, you know, I, I have a, a friend, I, I UPM to film for a woman, uh, like eight years ago now, Rachel Mason and her, her documentary, uh, God, a, I can't remember the name of it now offhand, but it's a, it's fantastic. And it, you know, did try back earlier this year and, uh, it's on Netflix now. It's amazing. It's her parents had, uh, ran a pornography store, uh, in, in LA. Uh, in West Hollywood for years, she grew up. That's what her parents did. They ran a pornography store, and it's like this cute little, you know, this cute little old couple talking about running an insane business uh, for years. You know, so it's a fantastic film. But I mean, that was something that she, you know, it, it's very possible she she produced that on her own, guerrilla style, and you know, it's it's worked its way into major festivals and oh, onto funny. Netflix, and it's. Yeah, that's right. I was just reading about that recently. Yeah, it's a fantastic movie. It's so good. Uh, I'm so happy for it. It's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, it's very possible. As much as I, I'm, I tend to skew on the cynical side of things uh, inherently, but uh, it is very possible, and I've seen it plenty of times firsthand, you know. Yeah. Oh, one last thing I'll say about that real quick. Uh, also, uh, if you can't get in touch with the distributor yourself, maybe a sales rep. Um, we had, like, R.J. Millard from Obscured Pictures. We had him on here to a conference with us. 
Um, he's a great sales rep. Uh, Synetic, I mean, you could hire, They ha right? I mean, you could hire. You can pay the fee. Yeah, they have a flat fee. They'll, they'll yeah. look at a project. You know, you know what I mean? Um, so those are just some other options as well. And it's called Synetic? Uh, Synetic. Synetic. Yeah. 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 And if you want to you know, email us, um, I, you know, I can send you, you know, their email address or website or whatever. Uh, but it's, yeah, Synetic Media. Um, th does anybody have any other um, any questions? All right. I think I'm going to see if I can say this right. Krunal? Yeah, that's right. How's it going? So, how you doing, man? I, I, I'm well. How are you, Josh? Good. Uh, so I've just also produced my first documentary, and I'm in the distribution phase. I wanted to know if I was to got, pitch my documentary to a company, would they select the festivals for me, or would... Uh, how does it work? Because a sale, yeah, a sales phase, agent would, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, finish. Because I'm at the phase where I'm on this website called Film Free Away, where you get the option to choose all these different festivals. And my. Yes, there, there are a lot on there, are there not? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it's a bit overwhelming. And I want to stay realistic with what festivals this will, the, the documentary will connect with. And. Um, sure. So yeah, it would be nice to get some kind of uh, realistic direction and get the absolutely. best potential. Yeah, so. you know, in, in an ideal setting, I, you know, a sales agent would absolutely tell you they would like to be involved from square one and absolutely steer the festivals that you hit up and be a part in that hitting up of them because they part of the good ones anyways part of their job is having those relationships that make it a little easier and grease the wheels on getting programmed in those places that are particularly attractive to, to a filmmaker so ideally yes um realistically for a independent filmmaker making their first film you'll probably have a very hard you know again just going back to the last question it's, it's hard it's, it, this stuff was easy it'd be even more overpopulated and oversaturated than it already is as, as, a, as, a, as a business with people trying to grab the first rung on the ladder you know so i embrace that part of it but it is hard and you know um again the the to, as far as making the selections again I, I would say you know look at the films that you like and look at the films and, and, and not only the films that you like but look at them from a realistic perspective films that were financed and 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 produced in the same manner you know it's a it's it's a different thing to go out and make a film a, 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 where a large budget's in place and you're able to interview people <laughs> just cursory people to to touch in on your topic that are of notable uh uh or have notoriety you know so it, it, it's 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 fine films that are both similar in type but also in production scope and and look at the the companies that they worked with and look at the it won't it shouldn't be hard anyways if the if the uh filmmakers did any semblance of a good job of marketing you'll be able to find what festivals they played and you know reach out to those festivals with a, you know john you can speak to this i'm sure how much does a cover letter go a long way if it says something that it has meaning and really sparks your interest as a programmer amidst a pile of god knows how many films like make the because you're doing the homework to know who to reach out to the correct companies to reach out to the correct festivals to reach out to speak to that and say why you know i did my homework and this is why i think my film belongs here you know uh, in your program and 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 uh convey that and i you know that goes a long way i think so yeah, i think i think generally yeah programmers and distributors i mean the main i guess the main thing you could say you look for is you want a film that has an audience of course right you want a high quality film a film that has, brings value to audiences um that the audience can really walk away with something special and you know, certainly, you know, ha has an audience. So I, I would certainly say, yeah, I mean, programmers and distributors, that's one of the main things they want to see. Um, Ask for Jane, your film, uh, Josh, um, clearly it's got a message, right? Um, right. It's obviously a, a, a strong, makes a strong political point. Uh, it also has talent in there uh, that people are familiar with as well. And the result is, yeah, I mean, you have cable deals, Apple TV, et cetera. So you know, I think that's, that's an important part of it. Yeah, that's one of the things I, you know, I don't, I, I've dabbled in a little bit of documentary, but most of the stuff I work on is narrative. And that's one of the things I envy most about documentary filmmaking and filmmakers is, is that, you know, they're most, in most cases anyways, there is a, there's a built-in cause. And this, that's one of the beautiful things about Ask for Jane too. And, you know, that was not a, a project that I uh, incited. I came into that after that, after the script was kind of already done uh, and, and, 
that was one of the first films I've ever worked on that had a genuine borderline documentary cause to it that, you know, a, a, a real political or social uh, wealth to what the film subject matter was and, and documentary in most cases inherently has that, uh, or you don't have a documentary in the first place. And it, it's generating audience is so hard to do if you just have a story. And in the case of documentary, if you have this cause, if you have this thing that people already care about independent of your project, all you really have to do theoretically is make them aware of this thing that they already technically like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's, that's a beautiful thing about, a, about documentary filmmaking is that the audience is there uh, for you because you're making, uh, you're telling a story about a cause, not just telling a story. And that's, that's a really nice thing about documentary. And, you know, hopefully it goes without saying that if you have subject matter that does that and has that audience that you're, you're trying to gather that audience from square one and make them aware of this thing. So when you do approach film festivals, sales agents, et cetera, that is one of your selling points that again, goes into that cover letter and, you know, look, this is why, you know, you, you're a film festival and like, yes, you're, you, you want to expose audiences to these stories that maybe otherwise they wouldn't have been aware of, but it doesn't hurt if your job's a little easier. I'm sure when you're deciding which of those films to, to program, if you have two, otherwise similar things the one that the filmmaker can go look people are going to come and put asses in seats because i already have this audience in this uh community um that's probably very attractive so doing the work to make sure or not make sure but try trying to have that in place before you get to that stage is, is a very important thing and a very valuable thing you know for getting the film out of the world right. uh, so we had a couple other questions uh you have gary hi gary how you doing Oh, got to unmute yourself. I do this every time I do one of these. <laughs> yeah, you just hit the un bottom left corner. <laughs> On the bottom left, you say unmute. See that? Bottom left, yeah, just it's a little picture of a microphone. See it? All right. I'll tell you what, you know, we'll, I'll take someone else and I'll come back to you in just a moment. You'll see on the bottom. So who, uh, anybody else want to raise your hand? All right. Um, let me go. Hold on. We have not Naji. Naji, correct? Naji. Yes. Hi. How are you doing? I'm Hi, Naji. How are you? Good. One other thing for Gary. Oh, you did it already. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have you. more tips because I've had a lot of issues myself. Um, <laughs> Oh, so this question is a bit of a long shot because there are so few successful narrative shorts, but I wondered if you have made or that's, been a that's part of That's not even kind of true. There are so many. <laughs> there are, it's it's e so much easier to, well, I don't know if you mean financially, yes, but just from an audience perspective, I mean, film festivals love good shorts because they're, you know, there's just more slots. There's more. Uh, You're able volume-wise yeah. to put more. Yes. Right, right. I mean, distribution wise, yes. from a distribution perspective, um, do you have, do you have any uh, experiences of your own or people you know who have been successful in distributing their shorts? Cause I know that's kind of different. And if so, can you tell me kind of how that went? Sure. You, do you, I mean, again, do you mean purely from a fiscal, per, fiscal perspective or do you just mean people eye, getting eyes on it? Because those are, those are two very different things and, and knowing I mean, what you want, you know. Yeah, I mean, well, distribution-wise, period. Beyond festivals, beyond just, like, having eyes on it in a festival, um, but, like, having it distributed to a streaming service or uh, a network or whatever. And I know okay. some people do self-distribution, but, I mean, eyes on it or fiscally, just beyond one play in a festival. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, the, you know the uh, the you know it's it's tough. You're, you're you're never you're rarely anyways. I shouldn't say never. There's no such thing as never. But the you're rarely going to see large acquisition deals for a seven minute film. Or you know that 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 goes out right. saying kind of. Exactly. Uh, but as far as you know, just getting it out there, and you know, it's not terribly difficult. Again, I mean, I it's it's. It, even Netflix programming, I see shorts programs on Netflix too, uh, of, of varying uh, kinds. Um, so even those kind of like big players, the Hulus, the the the, the highly curated SVOD platforms that are really the, um, you know, the gold standard for distribution. Even that, I think, is becoming more and more the case. And and honestly, even more, I think they're not producing content like that in most cases because it's just not viewed as a, you know, a return on investment really. Um, so I think that 
uh, just like film festivals, shorts probably have a slightly more advantageous route or, 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 or path of, of lesser resistance to getting on those big gold standard platforms in an acquisition capacity uh, for whatever reason they might be acquiring content of that kind. I think there's fewer of them being produced in-house, and that's why feature-linked acquisitions are, I think, down for those gold standard platforms is because they are now producing these things in-house. Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, all are doing these original things, and that diminishes their interest in wanting to acquire outside content via film festivals or however else they would find it. But anyways, going back to just what you could do if that's not the case, if, that, that, if you can't find a, way, a, a route to that, uh, you know, the, the company that I do a lot of my self-aggregation with this key, uh, film hub. Now it's called, it used to be called Kino Nation. Uh, film hub is great. And, and, and they are, you know, it's a, the no fees up front. You it's, it's a side thing. I want to say an 80, 20 split as, as far as revenue coming in. And, you know, you, you give them the assets, you create an account with them, you give them the assets all digitally. And they then, you know, they have a, a, on a rolling basis, they are, they are working to get titles onto, I mean, just a ridiculous array of platforms, most of which I haven't even heard of. You know, I get uh, small little royalty distributions from companies I haven't even heard of, which, you know, it goes without saying that that's a beautiful thing, even if it is, I'm not saying it's a lot of money, but it's, it, the idea of monetizing something to a place I didn't even know existed is a beautiful thing because yes, we all want it. We're, we all know of and are hitting on these big platforms, but the realistic way for an independent filmmaker to make money is not going to be those big gold standard platforms because a bunch of money is <laughs> directing things to work differently. So the way we are going to make money is to find these kind of less traditional means to monetize. And, and they are, I think, a beautiful uh, and very accessible route to doing that as an independent filmmaker. Are they considered a sales agency? Like, I mean, they they wouldn't probably want to be referred to the, uh, to the uh, as that but or referred to as that rather but that is in essence what they are i mean it's kind of it, it's kind of a more modern version of that and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a version that i strongly advocate we push to help become the norm as opposed to uh an outlier because uh like i said it, it, first of all just the 80 20 split is a more favorable uh arrangement than you're going to see with most traditional distributors and they don't have any fees associated with with um, bringing your content on board and a lot of again that's one of the terrible ways that a lot of um you know the 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 lesser distribution companies and, and sales agents out there that's where they make a lot of their money is 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 onboarding these films and charging you for you know uh, QC and, and other, whatever they, they're in my opinion made up <laughs> things that you know uh are, are not really um don't need to happen but the uh yeah i mean absolutely yeah and, and, and you know like i said you just give them the assets and you know it might take a while and it could be more and less successful depending on what the subject matter is there's a million reasons why things would be more marketable at a given time and and, and not another i've had library titles on there that i produced uh, my very first feature all god's creatures will i'll get you know they send it's kind of it's almost like if you've done a kickstarter or something uh the kind of little synapse uh <laughs> fuel that you know you, you get when when something cool you know just getting a cool little email they send you an email when it gets onboarded to a new platform so you know it's all it's all automated and when you know an old library title that you aren't even thinking about actively doing distribution related work for just gets thrown on a platform that you might be now making a dollar or two here and there uh that's you know it it adds up and, and, and that's a, a really cool thing for, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have a short that I produced in 2012. It was uh, a 24 hour film race thing that I made, you know, obviously in 24 hours. And the, the idea was never to monetize it. I never it was, you know, me and uh, three friends that like uh, on a whim decided to do this thing. And that film has been earning tuppence <laughs> on various platforms for years most of it through through formerly kino nation now film hub uh and you know that's just that's awesome and, and i think we need to embrace that and, and and not view that as a bad thing because uh, a lot of obvious reasons but um i don't know does that answer the question kind of yeah it does thank you yeah, yeah film hub's a good one and then also bid slate which they're a little more geared towards features because they are kind of a little bit of a hybrid of an old school sales agent that's looking to do foreign sales kind of. Uh, and they, I've had situations where they've made TV deals in 
foreign territories that are much the way a foreign sales agent would work uh, as opposed to random digital platform placements, but they also do that. They did Big Star TV was one of their big clients for a while, and that was a nice little moderate $30 here, $40 every, every quarter uh, for each title thing that was happening uh, for a long time before they stopped paying. <laughs> Recently, I just got an email from them saying that Big Star is no longer paying, but they paid for a while, and that's, that's better than some of them. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so those two companies are where I'd say uh, are good uh, self-distribution routes to just getting it out there, and, and it will be seen. And you know, again, kind of uh, Amazon is, is becoming a little more uh, in the last few months, they've become more stringent. They've even kicked titles off, to my understanding, uh, off the, the platform uh, for, you know, they cook up their reasons. But um, traditionally, that's something, there's no gatekeeper. You can know, there, there are platforms that there is no gatekeeper. Um, they don't, it's not curated. They just, if you just give them the content, they will put it there. And, you know, you can charge whatever you want for it, you know. So uh, those avenues are available too. And it's not, you know, a little bit of Googling will find most of those. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, no problem. And so, Gary, you were, you were, I think. <laughs> I'm back. Thank you. For, <laughs> yes, Gary, what, uh, what was your, uh, your question? Well, uh, seeing we're talking about extremely hard to distribute projects, um, I have a 12-episode documentary series. I spent six and a half months on the Appalachian Trail with a blind man. And... Okay. Um, I'm trying to get that distributed. I've got eight and a half hours done. Um, and I don't really have any idea where I can take it. I've Discovery Channel was interested a few years ago in the past, uh, but I'm, I'm kind of, well, where do I go now with this? So that's, that's my question. <laughs> well, I mean, again, I, I, I think it, uh, the, the, the easy answer to these questions of where you know how realistic it is to have ac get, get access to them and get any traction with that, well, that is, is, a, is a whole other topic yeah, of course but as far as where again look at while that sounds kind of unique and that's a good thing uh there are certainly s not entirely dissimilar things out there that you could look at see where they went look at the companies behind them you know not just where they ended up the channel discovery channel whatever it be but every one of them is going to have intermediaries uh starting with the production company down through probably sales agents and other companies and that stuff's all on IMDb, IMDb Pro uh, that you can you can do the research and and, and uh, you know some are easier to get in touch with uh, than than others but uh, you know the series episodic is no different I think than than the features and, and even shorts now I think because uh, there's not so much of a um, for the self distribution route there's not you know it's not a particularly gate kept arena anymore and you know if don't be a especially after i mean you know, how many years have, been, have you been working on it now uh, 10 yeah <laughs> see i mean like if uh, if, if, uh, if you wait for the waiting for that golden goose is the worst thing about this business i think whether it be you know i think that starts at the production phase and and, and i argue so frequently for, as, from, as a producer i argue so frequently with first-time filmmakers about the their perceived need for things to be the ideal condition uh, by which to proceed with their project. And my answer to that is you're never going to have the ideal conditions for your project as a first, it's insane to think that you would as a first time filmmaker. And by hook, my, my recommendation is always by hook or crook to get it out there and make it and just get, do whatever you can to as, get as many eyeballs on it as you can. Um, if it's the best idea you ever have, then you're fucked anyways. So, so like, you know, you're, you're not, you don't have a career in front of you if this is your only idea. So stop looking at everything as this precious thing that you need to find the perfect partner for, or find the perfect amount of money for, or whatever it might be. Uh, and, you know, as far as the actual route to doing that, again, uh, the, the, the companies that I just mentioned have, you know, they can give you access to, I, I have a, a documentary series on Amazon, Batteries Not Included. It's a, just a, you know, very little more than me masturbatorily talking to toy and video game creators of things that I liked when I was a kid and interviewing them. And it's just interview-based documentary series, very simple, very short episodes. Uh, and I've had through Film Hub a number of outlets that are geared more in the episodic realm that, you know, have two small varying degrees, monetize those projects to various platforms uh, that are, you know, specifically for episodic content and those exist. And, and the somewhat beautiful, somewhat terrible part of the distribution landscape and this kind of wild, wild west thing that everyone describes it as these days is companies come and go every day, you know, and that's one of the people think about Film Hub too is their entire function is to be aware of the ones that 
are working a little bit and, and worth the time. You know, they vet the, they don't just send people, con anyone content. They do a, a, a reasonable job of vetting the company before they partner with them to distribute the content. And, you know, they're kind of, that's how, again, how they act somewhat in a, traditionally in a sales agent capacity is that they're doing the job of the sales agent. Um, at a 20% rate is better than 30% <laughs> for, for, to do that job uh, and, and finding out the companies that, you know, you can work with ultimately to get your stuff out there, you know? So I would recommend, yeah, I mean, especially you know, if you have eight hours of content already, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you're yeah. proud of it, they're, you're happy with where it's at, get out there. Say again? Yeah. Well, they're going to know what they're getting. You know, okay. it's not a lot of ambiguity and there's a pretty good chance it'll be finished if it got that much done, so. I seem to be pretty low risk. You know, they can see what they're getting. So um, what I've done is I've been shipping DVDs of the first episode to places. Is it, am I wasting my time doing that? <laughs> Do you think they even have, especially a DVD? <laughs> Do you think they have a, a DVD player? Most people don't even, yeah. Yeah, most people don't even have uh, the, the gear <laughs> to watch a DVD. I know. But uh, no, like it, it would be much more, I'll tell you for just from a producing standpoint, it would be much more cost effective to digitize it for sure and send people Vimeo. Oh it, oh, it is. But trying to get to them is the problem. Get them to look at it. So I'm, I've, like I've set the disc in this and there's the picture and there's a lot of the basic info. So maybe they'll just see it and that'll be enough. I Listen, don't I'm, know. I'm not going to tell you, you know, you, you, an argument could be made that the, they are certainly, or not certainly, but most likely getting less physical mail uh yeah, than they used yeah. to so maybe you 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 love you know, you know this business is insane i've seen things work uh, that couldn't have been less likely so i'm not going to tell anyone that anything is dumb because uh, you know i'll be proven wrong at some point so you know do whatever but as far as cost effectiveness goes uh i think mo you know and especially physical things uh i think that from a the more reputable companies anyways are going to, you know, they're not even allowed to open that stuff technically. That again, that doesn't matter either. Some of them still will. If they're, if they're in a bind and they need some content, you never know, man. But uh, you know, from a, like the blanket answer of a company that you would ideally probably want to open it is going to tell you that they don't accept unsolicited submissions. And because there's a, just a mountain of legal liability in doing that, um, yeah. you know, it, it, it needs to come through a curated channel be it a rep or something so that's also one of the hard things about being an independent filmmaker you're of course not going to have that on, on your first go round too so um but yeah i mean I, I think you're much more likely to get traction you know one of the a, a really good pitch platform i like i do all my pitch decks on these days is adobe spark platform and it's a free website uh fantastic uh presentation on you know uh cross-platform um, compatibility. It looks beautiful, whether it's on a computer screen, on a phone, on a tablet, whatever it might be. Uh, and it's, you know, super simple to use, very clean, very easy, and a film, an independent filmmaker's best friend free, you know. So uh, Adobe Spark, oh. that's called. And it's... Adobe Spark? Yeah. All right. You have a couple more questions. Sure. Go ahead. We have Bill. Is that right? Yes. Bill. Yes, that's right. Bill. What's going on, man? Hi, Jonathan. How you doing? Great. How are you? And Josh, how are you? Good, good. Good. Uh, my question, well, you mentioned uh, Film Hub uh, before, and you seem to really like Film Hub. I read some uh, uh, good things about Bitmax. Would you say they are similar kind of company, Bitmax and, and Film Hub? Uh, I am not familiar with them. so You're not familiar with Bitmax? I will become familiar with them after this call because okay, I, like, I then, like to learn things too. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, well I, I've, I've been told that they're, they're called aggregators so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the right term for film hub but i believe it's the right term for bitmax yeah i mean like i said it's kind of a they, they have a, a as far as definition that's what I, honestly yes that's kind of my, what i was saying i don't think they would like to be referred to as a sales agent because i think there is they want right. to be thought of as a more forward-thinking entity than your traditional sales agent you know so you're saying a sales agent and, and an aggregator are kind of one of the same they are, an in, they are uh, like many companies in the entertainment industry, they are an intermediary between two parties. You know, okay. they, are, they are an intermediary between the producer, the production company, and the end user or the end buyer of, okay. of a project. And you had mentioned so, uh, another company that I, I never heard of. I think you said BidSlate? BidSlate. B-I-D is in David. Oh, B-I-D. Yeah, BidSlate. All right. Uh, similar to Film Hub? Like, they're a little different. Like I said, they... they, uh, they you know, and again, like, you know, they don't really put constraint if, you know, they're in it to make money. So they, I wouldn't say they would probably put a constraint on exactly 
saying exactly what it is they do. Uh, I wouldn't say there, I would say Film Hub is a little more entirely platform minded and Bid Slate does kind of function a little bit like an old school sales agent. And I've had them, uh, you know, package my titles with other uh, like titles and try to do library sales with foreign uh, territory outlets and such uh, okay. kind of in a more All traditional right. manner, you know, which is it's cool. And that's why I work with them both because I don't feel they do the exact same thing. Uh, okay. and, and actually, I'll tell you a little bit. Film Hub will now works with Bid Slate. So Film Hub will aggregate your film to Bid Slate. So that's more verification that they don't do the same thing. Okay. I think uh, I'll t just tell you something about Bitmax. They're a little different because you, you pay them a fee to put it on the platform. You're, you're, and that's you're, it. And then profits you're, you're, are 100%. You're, you're losing me already, Bill. That's, that's one of the, the biggest things I am, I am adamantly against. Okay. Uh, All right. That's why yeah. I'm asking you. Yeah. 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 If that's, if that's their business model, you know, I, I, I can't. It's not. You don't have to do it anymore, man. It's just. It's. It's bullshit. Okay. Bullshit. All right. That's, <laughs> that's plain English. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and you know it's it's uh you know the distributor was the 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 you know the right. big yeah they were they were a huge aggregator that fun their their that was their business model was this upfront fee and it it doesn't incentivize them the, their their chief profits uh their chief chief revenue uh source is not. The, 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 the job that you want them to do. And you want those two things to align. You right. want a company's earnings to be directly correlated with their productivity. You know what I mean? Uh, right. In your interest, because you're paying them to work for you. Right, you, right, they right. Take a percentage of, of your revenue. So the idea that you're going to pay them and then whatever happens after that, they don't care. Right, uh, they don't care that. Right. I, I just, money, I, yeah. yeah, I cannot stress, you know, again, their distributor, you know, distributor had, it's not to say that the, there are plenty of filmmakers that did well with distributor uh, before they folded and, you know, now have the rights to their film. They can't even get the rights to their film back to, to put the plot, put them on the platforms again uh, until the legal proceedings uh, yeah. sort out from that. Uh, so that's one, you know, terrible thing about that. That's a beautiful thing about film hub too, is they're not exclusive. You don't have to sign any term agreement. You, okay. You, 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 you can, you, you can even, you, not only can you uh, terminate working with them at all at any time, you also can partition off, be it territories, certain platforms, like Love is Dead is a, is a, 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 a the film that I had come out, a feature that I had come out uh, a couple years ago, and we, my co-producer on that and the writer of, of the source material is Irish, so we clearly wanted to take he's, he's born in ireland he's been in mm -hmm. new york now for about a decade and we, we clearly want he has a large uh audience in ireland basically so we wanted to ensure that we were tapping into that market now <clears throat> originally we were looking at it uh you know you would want to partition out amazon you know film pub will service amazon but there's no point in doing it because uh, theoretically if, if you all you want is u.s uh distribution anyways they the the um uh, the uh, their any filmmaker can get on sales platform allows you to uh, distribute to the U.S., Germany, Japan, and the U.K. Right, so any filmmaker can access those four territories through their what I can media on demand or whatever the hell it's called now their their, their platform, uh, video on demand platform. And uh, if that's all you want to do, then there's no reason in the, in the world to give it to someone else, uh, give those rights to someone else. So we were, you know. The other films I've done with Film Hub, we've always sectioned those off. Now, what Film Hub does differently, if you want to go to a territory outside of those four, they have a relationship with Amazon. Their aggregation deal with Amazon allows them to tap into like 100 some odd countries. So we ended up giving them our Amazon rights because they were able to have access to Ireland, which was important to us. So in that case, we did let them keep those rights. But in most cases, I would always section those off. From, from what I would give Film Hub, you know, um, as far as the, the platforms that I would let them have, you know. So, you know, it, it, that's just to say that the, 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 it's highly customizable uh -huh. how you work with them. And that's also very different than okay. most sales agents, too. Okay. I'm, I'm hogging you a little bit. Wait, re, I want that, that site you talk, uh, mentioned before, Adobe Spark, it's called? Yes. Adobe yeah. Spark. Okay. Yeah, it's, I think it's just spark.adobe.com. Early. Google it. Yeah. Okay, dot com. Okay. Uh, and one last question. Sorry to hog you up there. You, uh, you, uh, somebody asked you about do documentary uh, uh, distributor that specializes in documentaries. Does anybody pop in your mind as far as somebody that does a lot of comedies? It's just distribution companies. 
Yes. Uh, I don't know if there's any companies I would say are specialized in comedy. Um, again, man, don't don't ask me. Do do the homework. It's do always better. Homework, to, it's always better to do the homework. Look at the films okay. that are like yours. Go out and you, you that's, don't. That's what. And that's that's what you said earlier. But I don't, yeah. Just yeah. Don't 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 because because no one's gonna no one everyone's gonna have the the, the honestly the, the even if I had an answer for that it would be bullshit for you because I don't know your film. That's right. And it's one comedy funny. is not the same. You know, it's apples and oranges. Every film is apples and oranges. It's, it's not, I don't true. care what genre it is. It's a completely different audience you're looking at. Mine uh, is apples and cement. So it's right. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever, it might, whatever it may be, you know? <laughs> so yeah, so it's, it's, it behooves you to not go out and find an answer elsewhere. It behooves you to find it yourself because you are going to have yeah. the most tailored, correct answer. You know, only you know your thing, man. You're right, Josh. I was just getting lazy. <laughs> it's easy to do, man. The shit is nonstop, so I, I get the uh, looking for an easy way out is 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 very easy to let yourself do. <laughs> okay. Look, I'm, I've talked. I've used you up. I'm done. I'm no somebody sweat. else. Go ahead. No sweat. Okay, we got time for a couple more questions. So, Julia, hi there. Hi. Hey, hi. Thank you guys for today. This is great. Um, question, I'm going back a little bit to the business plan phase of all of this, if that's okay. And I'm curious about when you're um, putting your target audience, how specific do you want to get? And what is the best way to isolate your audience when you're trying to put all that together? Um, well, this is a tough question too, that is, in, you know, it's going to be, it's unique to every project, and that's uh, one of many reasons this shit is hard. But the, you know, this is why I think it's very important to make films. Instead of chasing what the market tells you or sales agents tell you you should be making, because this is the marketable thing right now. For one, by the time you get the film made and out into the world, that's going to not be the case anyways, even if they were right, which they're probably not. But if you make films that you want to watch, things that, you know, that, interest you you are going to know the answer to that you were going to know who those human beings are because they're like you you know and you're going to know the kinds of things that herd that audience together you know uh because it's stuff that you like have interest in are aware of have experience with and that is probably the best answer to that there's no blanket solution you know um and i think that you know the more <sighs> It would be great to make a film that could just, you know, every demographic wants to watch. That's a beautiful idea. And that's, of course, what a sales agent wants. And that's, of course, what a distributor wants. And that's, of course, what anyone who is financing your film would want. But from a realistic point of view as an independent filmmaker, you're not, you're likely not going to have the resources to make a film that does that. So stop trying to and make something that is ultra laser pinpoint specific you know and finance it structure your financing plan structure your producing your production plan within the means of what that audience can service you know what i mean um and that's easier said than done too of course uh it's you know finding getting those things to line up is very diff very difficult <laughs> um does, does that answer does that kind of answer the question i think so so i think you were saying like so when you put it on your business plan you want to be really specific with that audience obviously like anybody can say it appeals to everybody but like you know would you want to go as specific as you know a religious demographic in a certain age sure. group you know the women or men like that specific absolutely yeah okay. yes i mean i think you know because uh, something to understand and i i, I you know wh how many wh what are you putting together a project now where yeah. are you at and your life your, your, your timeline as a filmmaker is this your first project that you're going out and trying to find financing from from an out from outside not friends and family groups so i've worked in television for 10 years and i've financed projects in tv and digital okay. this is my first feature film what the hell are you asking um, me questions for <laughs> I'm very interested in what you have to say. Okay. Uh, and the script <laughs> finished. It's been written for over a year and a half now. Okay. And it actually has a sort of built-in audience just based on the subject matter. But I'm finalizing my business plan. And since it is my first business plan in, in a feature film, I just want to make sure that, you know, being too specific won't drive people away. I, I wasn't sure, sure. really sure with how you sort of categorize the audience for, for this particular project. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think... Uh, understanding you know if you've if you've been doing this for a long time already even if it's in a different uh area of the business then i i probably have an understanding of this but 
to be redundant, perhaps the, you know, your a, a, a financing pitch meeting is you're selling them something, even though they're giving, they're the one giving you something, you're selling them something, even though ultimately you want them to give you something. So like the, you know, the, the knowing what they want to hear without being misleading is the sweet spot on making that come to fruition. You know what I mean? So, um, knowing what they want and, you know, I, from a responsible perspective, financial remuneration is probably should not be the chief thing they are putting money into an independent film project right. hoping to achieve because it's a very unlikely result. So, you know, uh, now if, if that is, you know, if, if your, if your project is commercial enough to make that a viable thing to pitch, then of course, that's what you should pitch. But um, understanding what they want to hear, what is their goal in being a financier in your project, is what you need to give them to, you know, give them to, to, to get them to bite on it. So, um, you know, I, I, this is a little, honestly, a, a trick in the independent film sector, because it is such a hit or miss thing and so difficult to begin with. I often, when I'm talking to someone about giving me money for a, for a film, the first thing I say is like, if you want to make money, this, if, if your chief goal is making money, then you pro this probably should not be in your portfolio, you know? And I think, um, particularly with, with savvy investors, people who do in, invest in things frequently, uh, not just your uncle or, or dentist or whatever it might be, uh, the, that's a very effective way of garnering their attention because most people who do get pitched shit regularly, that's the last thing they ever hear. So, like, if you say that to a person who here's these things all the time, they're going to go, what? <laughs> you know, so you at least get their attention. You need to have a good follow-up after that, after that opening. But that's a really good opening, I think, for, to get their attention because it's not what they hear frequently. And, and, and being honest, if, again, if you're looking at this career and 10 years into it, I'm sure you are, if looking at this career is a long-term thing, you, being honest with these people and establishing relationships that, you know, even if they're not right for this one, could be right for, for something down the road. If you burn that bridge today because you're being misleading, deceptive, dishonest, whatever, you know, whatever your adjective might be, the, you know, that is, that's not good for your long-term prospects in this business. So uh, I'd rather be told no. Collecting the no's is one of the, it's, it's, you know, that creates the market for how valuable the yes is. So I embrace those no's. I, you know, how many of these things can I get before I get my yes is the way you need to look at it because you are going to hear a shit ton of no's. So look at them, welcome them, expect them, and that will make the yes that much more valuable when you get it. Uh, and and if, you, if you pitch things that way, honestly, when you do get that yes, it's, you know, it's it's just it it's going to create a better working relationship with that person, uh, both on this you know, having a financier that is unhappy over the entire life of of you know a, a short lifespan on a feature film, maybe three years for an independent filmmaker. May you know that's a, that, I think that's a short lifespan from inception to release, and you know it's not like the problem goes away once the film is released. But over those three years, if they are unhappy, they're going to make your life miserable. You know. So like, just from a, like a day-to-day -day happiness perspective, being that, presenting the project to them in an incredibly transparent light uh, is going to lead to your everyday wellness uh, being a better thing, you know? So there's a lot of reasons to be that way. No problem. Thank you very much. Uh, one, one last quick question, if anybody has a question. Max, all right. Max will ask the final question. Uh, hello, Josh. Nice to meet you. Likewise, man. Uh, so my question was actually in regards to one of the topics um, that I saw was going to be, um, you know, discussed on this panel. And, you know, me, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker. Um, I just made my first short film and it kind of uh, recently ended its, uh, its route on the festival circuit. It's run on the festival circuit. So right now I'm writing a script for a feature and I'm saving up money for it. And the goal is to, you know, get distribution or, as you were mentioning earlier, to end up self-distributing uh, it on my own and the question that i have is if you do find yourself in that place as you mentioned before where you know don't for say whatever it, reason for, for one don't say it that way it's not finding yourself there it's okay to be there it's not like a, right. you, don't, you don't fall into it uh haphazardly you know uh it's if it's the most advantageous way for you to monetize and release your film 
it's not ending up there. So that, that I just, I, it's so important. I think that we just change the way we talk about it from square one. So sorry to interrupt, but <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, cause you know, I think there's a good chance that that's what I'll end up doing. Um, but a question I had though is from a marketing and promotion standpoint, you know, once the movie is done, you paid for it, it's complete product. Like what do you do um, if you're not going through a distributor and you're doing it on your own, what is the best way, especially if you're putting aside your own money and your own budget to put sure. together a solid, marketing and promotion plan um to to bring forth the the best success if you're going to distribute it on your own what's the best way to go about doing that there is no best way that's blank, a blanket answer man you know it's that's uh these doing these things are funny because so many of the questions that a filmmaker walking into a project particularly the first time one are going to have there is no answer to because it's entirely unique their individual project uh per, and marketing is there's no place where mar where it's where that uh that is more applicable than, than the marketing distribution phase because you know all, what's the think about what you're trying to get someone you're, you're trying to get a stranger in a, in a pool of just a, an endless amount of, of content uh to both find it all but stop on click on and unless it's an SVOD situation or an AVOD situation pay for it like that's <laughs> that's a really long flow chart <laughs> to monetization uh, if you don't have a highly recognizable, highly marketed or, or, or uh, with a lot of financial uh, backing behind it, marketed product. You know, it's a very difficult thing to do. So uh, finding the way to make that a reality, just uh, each and every one of them is it's, it's that's a different human being. They want to see there's a different thing that makes that individual human being click. And knowing what your project is and who it appeals to, um, you know, you can, you, you, before you even start, you, of course, want to try to figure out what that is and do the marketing plan like Julia mentioned. And, you know, you're trying, but that's going to, you're going to discover things, particularly if it's going well, you're going to discover new demographics and people you did not expect to respond positively to your project over the lifespan of it. Um, you know, goat festivals are a beautiful way to do that. And that's one of the, the most beneficial things about them, I think. As for Jane was incredible. We had so much good fortune with uh, our festival run on that film that like, you know, you go to, <laughs> You go to these festivals and you have a room full of 300 strangers that are responding positively to a project and in the q a afterwards they're telling you personal stories of why this film meant something to them and you know they're someone that you impact in that way is willing to go so far out of their way to help you find a bigger audience and and, and help share the thing with with uh their social circle so like finding finding a way to have that effect on people there's no I, I god I, I can't you know there's no way for me to tell you what that is dude uh you have to be a problem solver as with everything about independent filmmaking you got to look at it look at the problem and it's an, it's going to be its own unique thing and figuring out what the solution to that problem is i can't tell you man you know i just can't um and it's again hard <laughs> So I know okay. that's like a shitty answer, but there is no answer, man. Uh, and it's why this stuff is so hard to do. And um, the victories are so far and few between, but that's also why they feel so good when you find them because uh, the shit is incredibly difficult. You know what I mean? Uh, so sorry, okay. I okay. sorry, I don't have a better answer oh, no for worries, you. No worries, no worries. <laughs> Thank you. You got it, man. All right. So uh, lastly, Josh, uh, you have a new book out, Still Filmmaking the Hard Way. It's part of the Filmmaking the Hard Way series. Right, right. Tell us a little bit about the Filmmaking the Hard Way series and then the new one, Still still Filmmaking the Hard Way, a right. uh, bit about the book and the series. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. The The first one I did uh, was after uh, – it's well, it really the, – the first feature film I produced, All God's Creatures, came out in 2012. And in part of this going back to Max's question just now, you know, one of the ways I found – and I think this is one of the easier ways with independent filmmaking to create traction for your projects is to share your experience making the thing because uh, – one of the very, very tappable markets for an independent film is independent filmmakers. So one of the things I did in making that film was I did a ton of blogging on a whole bunch of websites that most of them aren't even around anymore because it was 2011, 10 and 11 when we were producing that thing. Uh, and in doing that, I, once we finished the film and got distribution and even got a little advance, which was crazy to me, uh, we made that film for 30 grand all in, even after you know delivery costs to the distributor. Uh, and I realized that I kind of already had a book, so I just kind of assembled that <laughs> and put it on the internet, and that's how the first book happened. Uh, and, you know, I've been thinking about doing something like that ever since because I've, you know, done a lot of work since then. And uh, I think it's kind of all of our jobs as filmmakers to make the space 
a more informed one. It leads to better films, it leads to better filmmakers. And I think if we were all kind of subscribed to Ted Hope philosophy that I subscribe to very, uh, very, very much so that, you know, it, if we were all a little more transparent and a little more honest with our experiences, uh, you know, we wouldn't have these predatory distrib distribution entities and we wouldn't have all these intermediaries sucking, trying to suck money out of novice filmmakers' pockets because they, everyone would know that these things are wastes of time and wastes of money and, 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 and uh, we shouldn't be giving them uh, the time of day. So, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've bounced back and forth on whether or not to do it and uh, kind of the quarantine is what led to me writing this book. Like I've had, uh, you know, the, the film is, or the book is about three, I already mentioned three films, Catch-22, Love is Dead, and then Ask for Jane. And it's a soup to nuts from start to finish case study of each of those three films, exactly how it happened. You know, the only uh, opaqueness in it is where I legally had to. And there, because these are small projects without a ton of hands in the, in the cookie jar, I didn't have to do that very often. So it's, it's a very transparent look and honest look at how three films in the sub 250K sector came to be and you know can now be watched out in the the uh ether <laughs> and where, where where are the uh the book series available it's everywhere human beings read books ibooks uh kindle kobo um you can get it on paperback on amazon and um scry every i don't even, I even know <laughs> the i use an aggregator uh direct to digital was the aggregator i used to get it out there and you know half the platforms that i click the box of i've never heard of but uh all the major ones it's very available in so type it into your google box and you'll right, find cool. it <laughs> all right cool and lastly uh if any of the filmmakers have any questions for you uh regarding the book or just any questions in general about distribution or anything along those lines or maybe any recommendations What's the best way maybe, you know, you can be contacted through your website, Absolutely. email, yep. uh, social? Yeah, the more than one instance in the book, I say, if you have a question while you're reading and the shit I'm, I typed up doesn't make sense to you, don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, and uh, be it, you know, find me on Twitter, Instagram, uh, through my website, nyehentertainment.com. Um, you know, I production has started occurring again, so I'm starting to find uh, have some things to do but for the most part i'm just sitting around waiting for the, the world to restart so uh, i'm happy to have a conversation and uh help out however i can you know i mean it's obviously all right cool and nyeh entertainment.com is the website you can also email info at big apple film festival.com and i can send you josh's website link as well uh, and also if you're looking for names of any sales agents or anybody like that that we mentioned before i can uh, Provide you with some info and some other festivals, a big Apple Film Festival, of course, but there were also some documentaries we discussed. So I mentioned some festivals like Hot Docs and things like that. So, uh, you know, any if you want to email me or Josh any questions. By all means. Yeah, I mean, know. thank you so much for taking time out of all your days to listen to me ramble. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Thank you all for Absolutely. being here. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You thank you. Thank you. Happy filmmaking. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah. you.